The system is broken. The industrial marketing KPI system, it is broken. I have seen it happen from startups, from zero to 10 people, from 30 to 35 person companies. And I've seen it the most broken at a much larger global company. It's broken, period. And how do we fix that? Welcome to the Manufacturing Come Up. I'm your host, Malachi Greb, and CEO of Elite Automation. Today, we have a very special guest, somebody who just took the leap to start their own thing, Eddie Saunders. Welcome to the show, Eddie. Hey, what's up, friends and fam? <laughs> How's it going? Hey, it, it is well with my soul. It's a great day to have a great day. Um, it's a little chilly here in Ohio, but that's quite all right, because as a pure Ohioan, I love my seasons, man. So it's, <laughs> it's good to be here and chatting with you as well, my guy. Yeah, I appreciate it. So you finally just took the leap, right, to start your no. own thing after many, many years in the industry. How long have you been in the industry? I mean, some could argue since I was a kid, um, being, you know, working alongside my father when has he's been running his plastics manufacturing facility, spent many summers working in there, you know, kind of getting the under the table uh, pay just so I can kind of get some high school work. And even through uh, through college as well, you know, high school. And in addition to that. And my first big boy job was actually at an aluminum foundry. So with that, even though it's not been super, super extensive in a chunk, uh, man, I've just been inundated in the manufacturing world since I was a kid. I think also getting that exposure at a young age, like makes a huge impact on somebody's life. Oh, for sure. And then, and just, and, and honestly, it's instilled a lot in me, specifically that old, good fashioned Midwestern, like worth that work ethic, you know, that everyone's kind of a, uh, that brands, if you will, because I've watched my father really start at a very entry level and now make a way to where he's running his facility. So it's provided a lot of good insight and then also good hands on work to help me determine what I wanted to do with my future. Because I could have easily fallen in love with that specific type of work. And though I respect those who do it, I just understood that my path was a little bit different, but the experience gave me perspective for sure. I mean, because realistically, you spent a lot of your career more on the uh, like marketing side of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, that that's been the bulk of my experience for sure. And it's been awesome to be able to finally kind of cross that over. Did I ever think that I was going to end up really being as passionate about the manufacturing industry as I am now? No, I I would have laughed in my early 20s if you told me like, oh, yeah, you're going to light up manufacturing and just change industrial marketing. I'd have been like, you sound kind of crazy. Someone cut him off. Right. <laughs> but um, it's I wouldn't change anything. And it's I'm really proud, honestly, to know that I've got like my father and so many of my family members that are really there's such hardworking individuals and they've set such a good example working directly within the manufacturing industry. And so I feel like I get to it's a way of me taking my skill set and my passion and just applying it in a different way. I may not be manufacturing widgets or doing anything along those lines, but I genuinely feel like industrial marketers bring the same value that engineering, that finance, that all of these other individuals within the sector make as well because it's an inclusive effort that also includes marketers I feel like that some of your your marketing experience came from a younger age or was it something that was a little bit later in life so uh, there's a short funny story that my mom has told me and this honestly i feel like just determined my life path um, I was that kid where back in the day i'd be playing with my toys and as soon as the commercials would come on i can't make this up I would run into the room. I would watch the commercials. Supposedly, this is what my mother and my aunt swear to me. And to this day, um, you know, now my early 30s, but the commercials would come on and I'd watch them. I'd be fascinated. And as soon as it would turn off, I'd go run into my room and start playing with the toys. And that's <laughs> when I knew I was supposed to be in marketing and advertising. But yeah. uh, but just nonetheless, I've, I've always been fascinated with it, um, even though that is a funny story. It's just, it's always been something I've been super passionate about. Um, I wasn't one of those where I had to figure out what I wanted to do. I knew very early that I wanted to be in marketing. I, I've always just found it super interesting to study how humans make decisions. And then being just a natural empath, I'm just really drawn into why do they feel that way? What makes them think, feel, react, and do? Um, and then the science around that. It's just, it's really intriguing to me. Whenever, did you get any exposure at all back whenever you was like in a, a teenager and you just working uh, with your dad at his facility? Um, it, it was it was great to be able to have kind of the more hands-on experience, not a lot of the marketing, if you will. There wasn't a lot of that tie-in. I just kind of organically tied that in over time. And so it's cool that I can make that connection. But yeah. it was great because there were just a, a lot of options where I, I had the opportunity to go in and get my hands on parts and just do minimal cleaning. I was not doing anything unsafe or anything nuts by any means, not operating machinery, if you will, but being able to be exposed to how things are made instead of just consuming the products like we all do. I'm um, being able to kind of look behind the lens and just see, man, this is how these things are made. These 
these pieces of plastic that I'm touching and that I'm processing are going to go in cars. And that to me, just yeah. something clicked. And then even when I went into castings as my first big boy job working in the office of an aluminum foundry, like being able to watch the metal be poured and watch it, them pour it in sand, pull the mold off. And here comes a jet engine part. It was nuts. And I was hooked. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's probably one of the things that intrigues me the most about the industry is just being involved in, in like uh, a project or a process that, that goes on further into the, the building of a, of a jet engine or a vehicle. Like there, there's some projects that I want to win just to say we did the thing that did that other thing. Like uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the cool ones we did was for the, uh, the Mustang GT500 seats. So like that was a pretty cool one. I was like, I want that one. That, that's a super cool one. So now we can say all the Mustang GT500s, we we're involved in the, the seat framing of that. Of course you can forever. And that, that's, that's incredible. Right. And you have your hands on that now, like literally and figuratively. And so I resonate with that pride. That's something super cool that you're going to take with you for the rest of your life, man. That's awesome. So for like anybody who's like a, a, you know, a Ford fan or a Mustang fan, like I have a cousin who's like, he loves the Mustang. So like, yeah. this is a cool experience for him too, you know? There you go. Super American thing to love. And I'm about, I'm all about being American. So that, that's just a great thing. And, and I love how we as Americans take pride in our manufacturing because we know it is such a strong global uh force and and i genuinely take pride in it for sure but i'm, I'm just a good old-fashioned patriot when do you feel like you started to uh really lace in and, and start to do uh marketing for manufacturing specifically Sure. So what a lot of individuals either have come to find out or didn't even know is that the vast majority of my initial experience was in sales. Right. And when I was selling, it was either in the manufacturing equipment or it was in selling marketing and advertising products, platforms and services. Right. So once I started you know, a couple of years back working with the company Flex Machine Tools, um, I knew that at some point in my career, there was going to be an opportunity to pivot. I didn't know when, but I knew that I was going to be a dual threat. And I decided this in my late teens, early 20s, that I was going to be that dual threat. So whenever I had the opportunity to really make that pivot and I saw the crack in that door open, I was going to be able to jump head first with relevant knowledge and with a lot of steam behind me. And so um, I had that um, and it was it was cool to be able to have that opportunity um, at Flex Machine Tools. So I really respect and thank them so much for providing me the opportunity to shine my light, do some really cool things. and. As predicted, as soon as I had the opportunity, didn't know if it was going to be five, 10, 20 years, if you will. Um, and so it just happened to be a decade into my career, which was perfect timing because I had a lot of great experience to bring to the table. And it was a great time to, to do that. And as soon as I saw that intersection, I said, cool, I know exactly what I'm doing. And I haven't looked back since. And now I'm quite literally doing what I would argue to be my, my dream job that I've made for myself. Um, and it's, it's no accident, but it absolutely didn't happen overnight. You'd say majority of your career was actually more made up on the sales side of things versus marketing. Sure. And with that, it was more consultative sales. And I've honestly consulted and sold about every type of advertising and marketing that you are, have been able to do within oh. the last 10 years in all reality, from yellow pages and all the print marketing and billboards, <laughs> all the way to some of the most complex SEO, rich digital display cat, SEM, SEO, over all those types of campaigns as well. I um, mean, I even actually have my Google re Google reseller um, uh, certificate uh, for life. I attended a three week oh. program in Dallas, Texas, as part of one of my previous jobs, which was a Fortune 500 uh, marketing agency. So, like, I have all of that relevant experience, even going from 30 to 50 uh, person companies to startups to all the way to 11,000 person conglomerates. So, oh. I just have this wealth of experience as soon as I decided to pivot, and it's I'm very thankful for that for sure. But I'm also supremely thankful for the human beings that I've met along the process, you being one of them. Thank you very much, Eddie. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it sounds like a lot of, you know, what kind of happened within your career is like you, you were selling a product. However, being that it was a marketing product, you, you was getting uh, a ton of like education and exposure towards like marketing itself. And then also a lot of selling points, a lot of advantages of marketing. And mm -hmm. like you said, you know, taking, taking on, uh, educational courses that educates you on the product and, and the usability of it. You hundred percent. It was really, and it sounded like a crazy plan at first. Cause I thought, Eddie, just choose one way. But I said, no, if I can be a dual threat, I know that I can get my sales chops going. And as far as I'm concerned, I have a street PhD because I've got 10 plus years just in that specifically. And I've read over 50 books on sales, marketing, human development, and also human decision-making. So it's one of those things where I really, 
it came from that fascination when I was a kid. When I told you that I've just always found it super interesting why human beings make decisions and sales is very much an influencer of human decision making and yeah. marketing is the study and the facilitation of human decision making. So when it came down to both of those, I'm super Super appreciative and thankful that I stayed the course because there were so many opportunities for me to look at shiny objects. But for anyone who's considering either making a pivot or whether you want to stay, making yourself a dual threat and educating yourself. Now, not everybody can just you know, have a passion. I'm not saying everyone needs to do it the way that I did it, but I can prove yeah. that even a dunce like me can still integrate that. And if I prove that if you are truly passionate about something like I was about marketing. It doesn't matter if you're stuck 10 years in a sales career. It doesn't matter what, what that means. You can pivot yep. correctly if it's done strategically um, because I did it. Yeah, absolutely. And and it, I think it's super necessary too that like you go and you 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 do some type of job position or uh, even a different industry where you're gaining all these experiences from that type of job and that type of industry that you can then relate to, to this type of industry. If somebody was to say that they did marketing marketing in the industrial industry for their entire career at this point, the problem with that is, is there's not a lot of marketing in our industry. Like it's been something that hasn't really been around. It's really only picked up like the past like five years or so. Uh, you know, it's always kind of been there. But I feel like even today, like one thing that I really like about marketing individuals from other industries is they have different thought processes. They're thinking about different things and they're thinking about like, you know, different KPIs and different uh, metrics to, to like you know, measure and also different tools, right? There's so many different ways of marketing and, and like, especially for our industry, there's so many untapped potentials for marketing. 100%. And you, you said it so well, like you said, KPIs and what I need to do, I'm not going to yell it in the microphone for everybody, but <laughs> in all reality, the system is broken. The industrial marketing KPI system, it is broken. I have seen it happen from startups, from zero to 10 people, from 30 to 35 person companies. And I've seen it the most broken at a much larger global company. It's broken, period. And how do we fix that? We must open our minds up to what is new, what is modern and what is innovative and what's not being done as much. I'm not doing anything special. And you heard it here first. I'm not doing anything special. I'm doing things that are proven and work in every other stinking industry on the planet. It's mm -hmm. no secret as well that manufacturing is. You're right. Five or so years behind where a lot of the other areas are in marketing. That's why somebody like myself who comes in with just a little bit of mindset and a whole lot of enthusiasm can make a lot of good noise and have impact. And it baffles me how individuals ignore that. There's clear differences being made, but you're going to shackle yourself down to these standard practices and KPIs that you've done always because that's just the way that you've always done it. Yeah. And I, I don't understand why we optimize finance, why we optimize op like operations and why we optimize all these other parts of our processes. But why aren't we optimizing our marketing and our brand and our demand generation? I'll never understand that. There's only one explanation, Malachi. The system's broken. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's. And I think also too, like a lot of, uh, you know, the companies, they, they, going back to the KPIs, things, they're just not measuring things appropriately. Like, let's say, for instance, you know, uh, for a company like ours, where we're doing project based work, you know, you can look at, you can look at your measurement of w whether your marketing is working on a couple different things. You could either measure it on like the number of meetings that you're landing, or you could measure it against something like the number of purchase orders that you're getting. And what is the, what is the profitability on that purchase order that you won? If you, if you look at the, you know, dollar per meeting, it doesn't make sense. It's like, okay, it's it's not profitable. There's no ROI there. But if you look at it as your return on, on a purchase order and your profitability of that purchase order, now the budget increases by tenfold to, to be able to acquire a customer. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. And I'm going to challenge every industrial marketer listening to this because we're all about, oh, how many leads? All the, give me all the SQLs, the MQLs, and all the acronyms you want to make up. But let me simplify it for you. In 2023, moving forward, given all the data and analytics that we have quite literally at our fingertips that are built into a lot of the platforms we use, why aren't we tracking pipeline creation? Why are we automatically assuming that leads produced is the automatic value of sales? Because you know what? I have specific factors that if you just want leads, okay, I, I can implement a program that, that gives you that specific number. 
But why are we focusing on just that point? Why are we not optimizing the entire part of the process and the customer journey? Because um, last time I checked, a prospect doesn't become a customer until they have made a purchasing decision in the form of yes. So if we're not focusing on what we can do to optimize and that process, remove those bottlenecks, mm -hmm. everything else is just a vanity metric. And I'm not yeah. saying leads is 100% a vanity metric, but why aren't we focusing on pipeline created? Because then when we look yep. at that, we can also look at return on ad spend. That's a much better indicator on what you're doing across the board. And there's so many data points to interpret that as opposed yeah. to just simply looking at the amount of leads produced. If I go to another company and they say, I want more leads, I'm going to throw up on my keyboard, bro. <laughs> Don't, we yeah. all do. Duh. We all want that. Duh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think like for us as a company, we, we look at all the different metrics as far as like the cost per meeting, the cost per, the cost per lead, the cost per meeting, uh, the cost per RFQ, the cost per, uh, purchase order. And so each one of them has his own, own number to it that we can then associate and say, okay, well, you know, for this metric that we're trying to measure, what is this most likely fit with? And, you know, cause there's different things, whether we're running an ad campaign, so many different things that we're trying to measure, but we, we pull out the, the, the metric, the KPI that makes the most sense with whatever we're trying to measure at that moment. You know, you, like you said, you have to be able to look at the, the entire process as a full process and not just, you know, one thing like more leads. 100%. And I get it. Let me not discount the fact that everybody wants more leads for the most mm -hmm. part. That's cool. It goes without saying, but you mentioned, and it seems as if you are doing just the thing we mentioned is optimizing your specific process and you have multiple touch points and that's even more detailed than a lot of other individuals even need to go in the first place. So kudos to you for obviously taking those additional steps and having true touch points, but also recognizing which KPIs are the most relevant in certain situations. You'd be so surprised at the amount of, um, companies, entities, whatever it may be, that are focusing specifically on lead production across the board, regardless of the campaign, just straight lead production. And that is the sole thing that they're focused on. And it's crippling marketing teams. I'm watching individuals waste tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars on just misaligned processes, broken systems, and just genuflecting to the figures and KPIs that the person before them had to fulfill because that's the way we've always done it. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It's gross, bro. I just it's gross. Yeah, I think another big thing too that that you know I express to our team is that you know it it, it depends on the product you're selling. With us doing like project based work and and larger scale projects, the uh, you know, the measurement for us is going to be completely different than somebody who's selling a thousand dollar product, right? Like the people you're selling to the approval processes, the, the sell cycle, all those things are going to be so different. And, and because there's so many differences there, that also means like the, the value of our customer, the value of a single lead can, can be much more higher for a company like us than somebody who's smell, selling a, a small, smaller end, uh, or lower end uh, product. All things you have to be aware of, but nonetheless, you are clearly aware of your specific processes. And the big thing, the big flag to place in the statement as I turn down the passion a little bit is just challenging individuals to focus more on what really matters in marketing as opposed to just these specific leads. Because once it becomes mm -hmm. a, a lead per se, like don't forget that sales has some accountability um, as well. And when they close that marketing qualified lead, who gets the commission? Because as a guy who's in 10 years in sales, I don't ever remember writing a commission check to my marketing department. So that's something that we actually do differently. We yeah. Tell me about unpacking. What's we up? Write, we, 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 yeah. We write commissions to, to the marketing team. So we track where the lead comes from. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from there, we essentially, we initiate a, an incentive based on who was involved in the process. Marketing is a little bit harder because a lot of times it's not one direct person. There was somebody sure, who did sure. the copy, somebody who did the creative, somebody who came up with the idea. So it's a little bit more distributed versus like sales side. It's like you directly got us this lead. You're the person that gets the, the bonus. But yeah, I think it's important because, you know, they're involved in, in, the, in the process of uh, bringing in new leads, bringing in qualified leads and, and touching the right uh, the customer, the right customers and the right leads we're looking for for a certain product that we're trying to uh, mm -hmm. to sell. Cool. That's awesome. You need to talk more about that because that is something that is not being done. Not that we need to create a bunch of entitled marketers. And that's a marketing advisor going myself saying that I um, definitely don't want to create a bunch of entitled marketers by any means. But 
Uh, but, but that is really cool that you're able to do that. And I'm sure that obviously incentivizes them further to want to really track things. And also kudos. And one point I want to pull from that is that you have attribution in place, which that's another thing that really uh, people need to focus more on is having proper attribution. So you know where these things are coming from and not just hearsay. Dark social is the thing. I get that. Dark social is it's hard to measure, nearly impossible to do so. But oh. the fact that you, that people like you, Malachi, have that set in place. There's levels to this and you're on the next one. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it, Eddie. <laughs> so uh, wh where, where do you feel your, your career started converging more into back into the, the manufacturing side of things? Um, well, knowing that my, my first big boy job being at Aluminum Foundry, that was just cool. That was a great experience. And even though I kind of dove off specifically into marketing and advertising naturally, because that's what I wanted to do and I have zero regrets, I will say getting back into it and then jumping. Um, and when I joined the team at Flex Machine Tools, um, that was great. Um, and even though I started as just their sales manager, it was wonderful to get my, uh, get my chops up to be able to learn a lot of the industry lingo, uh, especially machining. That was kind of the big thing that I needed to learn. And those three and a half or so years there were fantastic fantastic and phenomenal. And it was a great runway for me to not only again, make that pivot, uh, but to just find my specific way and and really go head first into something. And my, my career path there was very interesting. I had about four or five different positions, I think specifically at, at, you know, in that company. Um, but I'm super thankful for it because it was a way for me to take my very unique skill set and maximize it. And it'll I'll, like flex will always have a place in my heart um, for, forever and always for sure because of all the opportunities that were provided um, to me to do the best that I could. And, and so flex was kind of where you re-entered the industry? Yeah, essentially. That, that is for sure. That is objectively, that is when I kind of re-entered in after that span of years uh, just in marketing and advertising. Gotcha. Yeah, because I mean that's really where I where I started noticing you and seeing seeing your content come alive. Yeah, I mean, uh, I actually, it's kind of funny. I had a link. I started it when I was like 21 years old. Never really took it seriously. So this is like over 10 years ago. Um, and it wasn't until about the last five or so years where I started dabbling into it. And specifically when I got really big into the uh, to the marketing side of Flex, I saw there to be a really good opportunity that wasn't being taken advantage of within manufacturing. And that's kind of humanizing brands. Mm -hmm. um, and we did just that. And it worked phenomenally. And there's still even even you know, a year after me not being there, there's still uh, enjoying some of the benefits of, of the work that we've done and we're scaling it. I'm super happy for them. Um, not that they, they didn't need me by any means because that, that's clear, but I'm just really happy uh, that they're able to do some things and still be an example. And people still bring up the things that were done during my time there, which is really uplifting to know that it, it you know, it's stamped, right? <laughs> Definitely. One, one of the cool things that, that I liked that you guys did there was the, uh, the different skits, you know, <laughs> uh, those are so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, yeah, I can't believe that we were able to eat like, I mean, I, I do believe it because there, there's clear, uh, you know, clear videos out on the internet, but it's, it's no, no joke. I can't make this up. I was meeting with a potential client yesterday and they pulled up a video, one of those real funny videos that I did with flex and they brought it up in the meeting live. So that just continues to let you know that people do see these things and whether you get a lot of comments or not, people are viewing these yeah. things. There are, there's silent fans they exist almost in abundance and so uh, i appreciate you bringing that up because it's it, it was fun work um and i loved how it wasn't really as much about the products but the fact that we could tie it in and adding humor was just that little layer that allowed it to be more digestible and it was so outside of the box because nobody else was doing anything remotely close to that and i would argue that in manufacturing people are still afraid to do it yeah, and sure it just bugs me yeah no i think it's it's something that uh it's super impactful. You know, so when people are not doing it, you can create this fun brand, especially like manufacturing where it's like, there's not any, any of that type of marketing going on. Like we, people could do stuff like that and really, really stand out. It's actually been one of the things that I wanted to do for our company ever since I've seen one of your videos that was, uh, you know, of those skit style videos I was like, man, I want to do some of those. Cause I got like some pretty cool ideas where we can like, you know, be the programmer, you know, be a programmer on site. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've had some cool ideas. I thought of like, I'll tell you this, like one skit that I had is yeah. where you have like, uh, uh, this Billy Joe programmer guy, right. He's programming. And then, you know, elite automation. One of the, our things is like, we want to be the best, right? Well, mm -hmm. the programmer guy is not doing his job. Basically a lead automation guy comes in, he rolls his seat out and, and basically takes over the job. He's like, basically like, get out of here. We're here to, we're here to do this thing, you know, but yeah, I thought it'd be really cool to do some skits like that. And there's fun. 
try one. That, that, that's the biggest thing. Like your first one may suck and that's okay. But dude, at Flex, we did an Easter Bunny video, you know, which was funny. Had nothing to do with machines. And, but we, we tied it in, of course, because we were having a specific sale, this and that. And the Easter Bunny was hiding the products, yada, yada. So if we can do stuff as silly as that, I would say try it because the thing is that you never know um, when it's going to come up. And I still, I can't believe people are bringing up those assets, but I'm also not surprised um, because right. those things are impactful. And when I talk about the ease of content being engaging, educating, and entertaining, some people are afraid to be entertaining because that requires you to be vulnerable. And I, maybe I just don't care enough um, about what other people think, but, yeah. but I also know the all the feedback that I've continued to receive and, and the just the little victories that have been cashed in because of all of that. And I can say because of the specific content that I've made over the last five years, it has quite literally changed the trajectory of my life for the better. And that's just an accessory to that conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And another thing is too, you mentioned a second ago was you have like a, uh, a hidden audience, right? And this is like one of the huge things that I think people should should think about because I think there's, there's just regular individuals who put out content because they like to put out content, right? They're not even like a content creator. They just like to you know talk about the industry, talk about things that are going on in the industry. And there may be some of those individuals that maybe they don't get a lot of likes, they don't get a lot of comments, but there may be a ton of people who are like watching that content and are very loyal, repetitive uh, viewers of, of the content. You know, exactly. at, at these individuals like like they're a newsletter or, or something like that. Subject matter experts are a thing. They really are. And um, part of my demand gen playbook, you know, that I run for my business is very much regarding like humanizing the brand. I won't give away the secret sauce by any means, but <laughs> knowing that um, and you saw a lot of what I did, we took industrial like capital equipment machinery, you know, six figure investment machinery. And we made it fun. We made it funny. And we we slapped a human being next to it to talk about the products. And it worked really well. And I would argue that objectively and subjectively, it generated more attention for them than they had ever acquired ever. Um, and even when I was launching a global product in my last position uh, with them, I, I humanized the brand. And I've never tried to insert myself into situations, but it's also I've done this before. Don't ask me to dunk a basketball. Don't ask me to hit a hole in one. You know, don't ask me to French braid your hair, but you want to create some noise in the manufacturing. I got you in spades, my guy. Where have you been at like the past couple of years? What have you had going on in life? I mean, me, I'm just raising four kids. Um, and that, that's a huge thing to me. Just my family is, it's a big, it's just the root of, of who I am. If you remove that from my situation, you remove a lot of who I am um, as a human being. And so focusing on that has been great for me and building and developing these legacy type of items. Uh, you know, I'm not just trying to make a bunch of content, you know, just to elevate myself by any means. Part of what I do is because I really do want my kids to look back and, and them to think, man, dad did everything he wanted to do. He had a freaking good time doing it. And he was respectful and he was classy the entire time. And he made a lot of people smile. And so... The, uh, I've been focused on a lot of legacy things lately. Um, mm -hmm. As I've finished out my 20s and I'm now you know, well into my 30s, um, this next you know, decade of my life, I've been grinding in my 20s and now I want to be able to build in my 30s and then hopefully by my 40s, not trying to chill, but I can then more manage and coast and pivot as I need to. So last five years, it's been really changing. It's been me taking that career pivot, which has been big, running in that specific direction, leading to now being self-employed and, and really enjoying the story. But above all things, just trying to be the best husband and the best father and the best friend um, that I can be, because that, that's really at the end of the day, what matters the most in my eyes, everything else, whether it comes to money, this and that, whatever, all that comes in result of me being a good father, a good husband, and a good friend. Yeah. I, one thing I'd like to really, really point out with you, uh, and, and you probably have this characteristic more than majority of the people in the industry, uh, but it's just like your, your personability. You have just a way of being able to communicate with people. And, and, I, and I want to point this out to everybody that, that's watching this, that this is like a great characteristic to have, just like, just to be a, a kind person, be just a good, genuine person, you know, this, that I don't say a skill set, but just that characteristic is something that takes you a long, long way throughout your, your career and your life's journey. And it'll put you in a lot of positions that, that, that will just come to you and, and present themselves to you. And, it, and it's just kind of just because you're doing the right thing and being a good person. Well, I really appreciate you saying that um, because I by no means want anyone to think that 
I'm just talking the talk. I genuinely walk the walk and I don't promote this whole empathy situation just for my benefit and for my gain. Like it's something that I believe right. in and it's, and it's rooted in my fascination for why human beings make decisions. And I said, that's been a thing since I was a kid. I've right. just synthesized that into productivity. Right. And I've made horrible decisions. Like I was selfish in my early twenties, truly. So I'm not sitting there and trying to act like that person who shows up to church on Sunday and is super perfect. Um, but then, you know, Monday through Saturday, I'm an absolute hellion. Uh -huh. You know, I'm a, I'm a hellion sometimes. Don't get me wrong. But, um, but, but I, and I don't want anybody to think that, that again, like there's just this, some or persona. I mean, I have struggles just like anybody else does. I have things that bug me just like anybody else does. I, I have little spats of my wife, just like anybody else does, you know, in, in a sense. <laughs> But um, how I synthesize that and what I choose to make the most important to me, I think does help define that. Um, Cause that's something I've always tried to keep myself honest is like, Eddie, do you believe in what you're saying? Or are you like a lot of these other people out here who will remain unnamed who are just talking the talk? Uh -huh. um, so all that to say, thank you very much for saying that you didn't have to, that's super kind of you. And though no human being really likes to seek super affirmation too much, it's always a sweet pill to swallow. Do you think that, or, or, or what do you think, has has transitioned you to be even more of a kinder person um having four kids that are completely different and and me i think with age as well just recognizing that if i'm gonna truly be the empath that that i know that i need to be mm -hmm. th that i need to make sure that i'm focusing on other and so having four kids really that and just so much or so many conversations, I should say, like so much interaction with other individuals. I'm just a social butterfly by nature. And so it's provided me an advantage to just gain so much perspective that in tandem with all of the books that I've read and all the podcasts and audio, whatever, all those all that content that I've digested um, when, when you when you subject yourself to so much of that. Yep. you're either going to embrace it fully or you're going to reject it immediately. And I just have embraced it. And I found those little things in life. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm the most blessed dude that I know. Like, and I may be a little biased, but like <laughs> having my children and shifting my mindset to being grateful because I definitely come from a place where I didn't have a lot, you know, um, and I have just like we all do. And then no one's situation is worse than others. But um, cause I know trauma is subjective, but I had a lot of cards stacked against me specifically in my early twenties and made some selfish decisions, but being able to, to emerge through that and to still maintain some positivity and be able to see that there are two sides of the coin and recognizing that sometimes situations suck, but also mm -hmm. it's not what happens to us is what happens for us. That mindset or mindset shift has been huge for me, man. It's been monumental in my life. Yeah. I think one other thing that that's helped, uh, or one thing that's helped me with, like my mind shifts is, is consuming of contents, consuming of like audio books, especially uh, like human nature type of things. I don't know if it's like something for me that like, I'm a, I'm a kind person at heart. Like I have a lot of philosophies that are like doing the right thing is always the right thing. The truth always wins. Like these are some of the, the like uh, mottos that I live by. However, like one thing that I struggle with as a human is just conveying those things like publicly conveying and displaying those things. Like I might have a lot of emotion towards somebody, but then sometimes not have the best or not do the best job at conveying that to that person. Sure. Which is understand. It's like, but you recognizing that is obviously a superpower because seeing and being transparent with yourself, I think helps a lot. And, but, but the thing is that you in recognizing that, you know, that you're able to do something about it. It doesn't make you a worse or better person for just not being able to essentially express it. And that's one thing I try to take pressure away is like, I don't walk around every day trying to help old ladies walk across the street, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like I, I'm not walking around just washing people's car for free. Like I'm not this incredible philosopher, yeah. you know, amazing human being. Like I genuinely have great intentions, just like so many others. And I'm not trying to do anything to pump up myself. I just want to be a solid reminder that we can turn the mirror around and be like, hey, you have all of these qualities too. You just need a reminder is all that it is. Um, and sometimes just someone's saying to you, hey, go make somebody's day today. Just go give it a shot. Make one person's day today. You know, it's going to make you feel better. Sometimes just hearing that helps. And it's another reason why I don't watch the news because yeah. we all know what they're, and I'm not trying to avoid the doom and gloom. I understand that. But I'm not subjecting myself to that type of content. My wife, she she likes to read the murder stories and all the this and that happened, like all the horrible things. And again, we're, I'm not trying to ignore it, but I just don't want to I don't want that to be the food that I eat because I, I treat yeah. my mind like I do my body. 
Um, and my perspective, like my body, if I put junk in, I'm going to get junk out. Now, I like a cheeseburger every once in a while, and I like a good stupid meme every once in a while. <laughs> you know, I get it. I'm human. But um, but I think making sure that we reverse engineering with intention when it comes to empathy is, is, it's, is it's natural for a lot more people. It's just, can you act upon it, right? And do you even need to in the first place, right? Have you ever heard of uh, valuetainment? No, it sounds super awesome. You're about to unpack that for me. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's it's uh, originally when I found them, like some 10 years ago or whatever, they were uh, they did a lot on business content. Now they've kind of changed their like content strategy. They do a lot of like uh, news updates and stuff like that. So it's a YouTube channel, valuetainment. Uh, nice. But uh, I went to one of their conferences and, and whatnot. It was actually going to their, one of their conferences is, is part of uh, what gave me like the confidence to, to start my own company. Mm -hmm. I realized I, I, you know, I went to the, one of their conferences. I, uh, I invited some of the, the senior management of the company I was working for to go. All of them declined to go. And, and I even offered to pay. And, and uh, you know, so when, whenever they declined that, I was like, huh. OK, so I'm, I'm evidently willing to do something different that, that other people aren't willing to do. I'm willing to take a, a vacation time of my of my own to go do this educational seminar. Uh, mm -hmm. But but so that's another thing. But going back to it, they, they offer like a lot of uh, uh, good content that is more of a statistical thing. Right. It's not so much on the drama and the mm -hmm. this inflating things. It's just like more pure, pure data. Well, like to, to your show's theme and talking about, you know, the come up, if you will. One thing I think that has fueled that is your raw intention to want to grow, to want to do something better. And even if it was on your own time and I resonate with that statement and it's because you betting on yourself and investing in yourself it has landed you by consequence and by virtue and by nature in the position in which you are in now, which is, I would like to assume a much better position than you were before because you invested within yourself. And it's something to that point that I've done extensively as well. And I've taken those risks and I know it's scary and it's hard sometimes, but even as you can attest personally, it can lead you into wonderful places. I mean, obviously love the one you're with and you'll be where you are and be focused and have head down if you will. But the end of the day knowing that you can invest in yourself you can trust in yourself um and not that it's all cushy and rainbows and butterflies and unicorns but the intention there man you've nailed it happy for you yeah thank you and one of the things that you mentioned earlier on is like how how many like uh, audio books and books that you you read and listened to you know i can't express how much of an impact that has on somebody's life as far as you know, just the progression towards anything, right? Like if it, whether it be happiness, business, marketing, anything that, mm -hmm. you know, these influences and these insights, I mean, I have like in my audible, I have probably over 120 titles or 120 books in my, in my arsenal there. And out of those 120 books, I've, I've probably listened to every single one of them 10 times at least. Wow. And, nice. Yeah. Just, you know, and it's pure, just like brainwashing myself with this content and, and, you know, I have everything from, you know, sales, marketing, uh, human behavior, uh, even just stuff like kindness and happiness. Like, you know, some more of those uh, some some books that are just about life, you know, and, and like how to be a better parent. Just like listening to other people's philosophies on things and just taking their nuggets away on, on you know, what what their thought process is on 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 different topics. I love it. I love it, man. It's it, it's clearly a strategy and and I need to get back into it because, you know, it's something that I hit hard for quite some time. And and it was great. And I'll say working from home has spoiled that it took my commute away. Right. And yeah. so but knowing that it is and I, I couldn't I really I couldn't support that comment that you, that you had made further about just the value that audiobooks can bring. And for someone who believes in that so much, I'm just going to keep myself honest, need to jump back in for sure. So thanks for the, thanks for the nudge, man, whether you meant it or not. What What are some other things that you feel like have ha made a, a pretty big impact on, on your career success? The people that I have surrounded myself with 100%. Um, network has been my net worth almost literally and figuratively. Um, it's, it's really been crazy. And I even said this in some prior interviews, like when I'm asked what my favorite part about this industry is it, it, as much as you know all the things that are made and the processes and everything raw materials cutting it down like that's great but it's the people it really is the people um and and i'm i just happen to be surrounded by incredible human beings and so 
uh, I don't know whether it's again, but by just by accident, the universe has led me this way, but I'd like to believe that my mantra of being intentionally just a good human or trying your best as you can has attracted those people and deterred the opposite. And so I've just by nature attracted to these awesome humans that have led me on some amazing journeys, have provided me incredible opportunities and have helped me craft wonderful lifelong friendships um, along with memories just as a cherry on top. So that that has been almost hands down uh, what has happened. Because if I even think about my career progression, not just within manufacturing, but just in general, it has been because of my, it's been a direct result of me being uh, kind and empathetic to other human beings. It's kind of ironic, but it's also not. So um, be a good human. It can do things for you. I promise. I mean, whenever you say like people, right? Like, mm -hmm. is it just different aspects as far as like you mentioned, like, I, you know, I, whenever you were mentioning off different things, like I was trying to analyze and like, see what are like the things that were uh, the like logical, like tangible uh, impacts that were given to you. Right. And so like a couple of things that I, that I heard there were, um, that, that people were, were transferring skills to you. People were giving you opportunities. Can you, can you elaborate on, on some of this? Like a, just a little bit more. Oh, for sure. Go seek mentors hundred percent. Like just synthesizing it like to an actionable item for anybody listening, sure. go seek mentorship from individuals. You may think these individuals are too big for you. They'll never talk to you. You would be surprised at the type of mentors that you can secure by just simply asking. Now, I'm not saying go hit up all the people that you think are in a position where that you want to be. But if you are, if you resonate with a specific human being or entities, whatever it may be, go DM somebody. It's 2023. You can contact people in 17 different ways, you know, it just with by your phone. So right. please go connect with other humans. If individuals are doing things that you find intriguing and that you like, or that you most importantly want to replicate, or you want to be in their position one day, maybe just literally or even figuratively, reach out to them, learn what they did, learn the mistakes that they made. Because what I'll tell anybody who's afraid, like, oh, well, what if they reject me? Cool. You don't want them to be your mentor in the first place. And right. mentorship doesn't mean you have to just hold these people down and you be, it's not a big, you know, big brother, big sister program by any means, but wanting to genuinely learn from other individuals, we as human beings like to feel intelligent and important and valued. I mean, it's the reason why we get married. You know what I'm saying? You know, for lack of a better term. I mean, there's lots of other reasons, but you know, it's like, that's why we seek connections with other human to feel valued and all those things. So why not apply that basic human principle to getting transferable skills from these subject matter experts that are in a position that you want to end up in. I have saved myself probably years of incorrect implementation and execution by simply consulting with those who have been there and paved the way for me. And it's paid me, it's, I mean, I would argue that's paid me dividends in the form of time saved from making bad decisions that other people have already made and care enough to try to help a silly dunce like me avoid from making them like they did. And it's so like, say for instance, like somebody is looking for mentorship, like, you know, how, how do they go after that? Or what level of like mentorship do you think they should look after, look for? Sure. So I, I, um, leverage this model told my cousin to, to utilize this as he was graduating college um he wanted to like produce some music and and he knew kind of who he wanted to talk to and so i had told him you could even be as bold as a strategy where you just have a template message that says hey i am so and so i'm a student from here i'm studying this i saw what you did and i find it super interesting i would love to be able to pick your brain or to learn more about what you did and you, you, you can even ask, you know, looking for mentors, if you will, sometimes depending on, on, on your field, you don't have to essentially go right for that, but saying, Hey, here's who I am. I'm interested in this. I've seen what you've done. I would love to learn more, not trying to sell you anything. I'm just really into what it is that you're doing. If you have not word for word, but if you have that message, um, so what he did is he took that message, spread it across the, the individuals that he wanted to talk to, got some minimal response, got ignored, you know, got a negative feedback on one specific level, wasn't talking to that person anyway, but the individual who responded to that it became a multi-year relationship where he gained relevant experience from that individual, ended up moving out of state, and it became a lucrative opportunity for him. 
all because he went and sought after some mentorship from somebody because he wanted to learn. You'll connect with the right human beings. And I believe the best mentors are open-minded to that. And if they're not, that's okay. Timing is everything. But just seeking it and wanting it and literally reaching out, whether it's on LinkedIn or DMing them across a variety of platforms, it's a great opportunity for you to network yourself and be able to pull those skills that are going to come from those conversations. Yeah, this is actually something that literally just popped in my mind. But you know, like with the manufacturing come up and, and it, and it dim or it, it, uh, being able to facilitate like people's experiences in a way like this, this particular podcast is a way of mentorship, right? Like to gain people's experience of the industry and, and, and their different career paths and, and what their, uh, you know, strategy and, and their experiences were throughout their careers. Um, it really helps give people like an insight to what, what it is that that other people have experienced in life for sure that's what i miss about you know doing my old podcast is, is we didn't talk about our products at all it, it was an agnostic con like um you know a show for that point but loved hearing about individuals from across the industry and all of their experiences and what they liked and learning something about them that you they wouldn't post on linkedin you know getting to know the humans behind it so so yeah i i definitely understand and, and definitely applaud you for that specifically because it's a great exchange of value in the form of these conversations and i love it and i support it wholeheartedly thank you so what what do you have going on right now right you just took the leap mm -hmm. i want to know i want to know what it is that finally gave you the confidence or gave you the ability to to take this leap? Well, a lot of the things that I was complaining about you earlier in our conversation about all these broken systems and processes, broken KPIs, I just, it was hard to sit there and continue to watch. And I've developed some awesome relationships with those incredible human beings. And so after just months and months of planning and taking the time, but primarily just letting it kind of go on autopilot and allowing the universe to tell me the correct time. Um, not that I was waiting for the right signal, but I, I just knew that the universe was going to put me in the right position. And if that was meant to be my journey or my path at that time, it was going to be clearly revealed to me. And after a couple of circumstances, it, it just made it very clear to me, this is what I need to do. And this is years, obviously. And um, a lot of individuals don't know, but I had done some side consulting earlier in my career and I was able to really do a lot of cool things with that. And the only reason I left doing that is because I had a great opportunity to work at a startup. Now, having worked at startups to growing companies, the small to medium size, as well as large corporate conglomerates, I bring 13 years of experience to the game. And though a lot of individuals at my age would be seeking and with my experience looking for VP and big director roles, I thought I, there's so much more value that I could provide. And instead of just working solely for one individual, I'd like to pick the individuals who really want help, need help, and are seeking that opportunity to make good noise. And so that allowed me to branch off and to create, you know, Speak Friend, which is something I'm super proud of. And at the end of the day, um, it's nice because I get to connect with manufacturing clients to help them develop demand generation tactics and also a content development and scalable strategy. It's it's really exciting and I've got a lot of great feedback to it. Um, and without any arm twisting or any pitch by any means, okay. it's just I'm super lucky to be able to take these out of the you know out of the box and unorthodox ways of thinking and things that I applied that clearly worked at other companies and now providing that playbook to individuals who really could use it the most. And it's what better time to be able to do it when we have so much momentum going in the industrial marketing world. Do you, do you think that was it or was this something that you've had in your mind for some period of time? Uh, doing the consulting in my earlier 20s as a part time basis was fascinating to me and I loved it, hated that I had to stop it. And, you know, even though I've been playing this for some time like this, the excitement for wanting to do that, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit in my in my blood. Um, just with my father and a lot of the, uh, the endeavors that he has taken place in over his life. And a lot of my career earlier was spent really consulting and working with strictly small to medium sized business owners from a consultative nature. So I've done this before. I just was a W2 employee. <laughs> Now I now I've got again 13 years of experience yeah. cross platform cross functional and cross industry experience and um, with all the certifications and educational points that I have I mean I've got a street PhD in what it is that I do and I can confidently say that there's nobody else in the industrial marketing world that's doing quite what I do quite like how I'm doing it. And that's what makes a difference. And now I'm just excited to bring that to individuals so they can break those shackles and release themselves of the chains of what leadership thinks is good industrial marketing. So, so as of right now, what, it, what is your, uh, your ideal target customer? 
I mean, right now it's it's nice because I love working specifically with industrial, you know, just with manufacturers. Uh, so whether it's you know robotics, you know, technology, or whether it's just making raw materials all across the board. But individuals who are either in need of someone to really direct and help their marketing go from zero to one, or there are some individuals who kind of have a good foundation where they're going from 0.5 to one. Um, if you will. And so laying out the good foundation, generally auditing what it is that they're doing, looking over cost and really serving as that marketing leader that they need, but in some cases maybe can't afford or it's not as cost efficient for them to have somebody on full time. You know, you don't have to pay, you know, fractional advisors, any type of a general overhead. There's just your specific engagement that you that you commit to. And then aside from that, there's a lots of cost savings that can come from that specific model for the end users. So it's what I like to really view as a win win for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like for some insight from like me as a company or, or for myself and, you know, our company, uh, like this is something that I that I think about with uh, like the outsourcing of marketing. Like as of right now, we're not outsourcing anything, but you know, I you know I think about things like let's say PR management, or uh, you know I think about certain objectives, right? Like let's say for instance, like I want to get myself on on more speaking engagements, pla uh, or a podcast, different things like that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, something like that may be. Um, it may be better that you, you you outsource something like that because you know somebody has that that industry experience. Maybe they're already doing it for other clients, so they already have mm -hmm. all the proper contacts. It's just a matter of you pay the amount, they press send on on all the things that they're already doing because they have the processes in place. Mm -hmm. And and you know I think this is like something like that that you offer. Maybe not necessarily PR management itself, but just you know the the things that you're offering are are a full uh, like gamut of things that, that you've had exposure to your entire career and have built processes around it mm -hmm. and, and are able to offer that, that value. Yeah. He's just bringing on a 13 year battle tested, proven marketing adventure that, you know, puts out good stuff and you don't have to near the cost of having a full-time employee, but you have me in your back pocket as much as you need and not more than what you want. You don't have to create a desk for me. You don't have to have a parking spot for me. You don't have to buy an extra pizza for me at your company pizza party. You know, if you want to invite me, cool, I'll eat some pizza, but it's a great model. And, 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 if, if COVID taught us anything, it's that we can operate from a remote basis. So even though that I have clients that I can go physically visit, you know, it's wonderful to be an extension of their specific team and to have that trust. And the accountability is still there. So you don't have to worry about it. And at the end of the day, we both, we all get to choose who we, who we work with. So even though I'm not going for, you know, a hundred client portfolio by any means, I get to focus specifically on four to five clients and really help them to the extent in which they need, knowing they all have different needs per se. You know, I've got one client where there's maybe five or less employees. Another one is a global company. They both leverage the same human being, but with my variety of skill sets that I bring to the table, I can add value. There's few places that I can't add value in all reality. And so I take a lot of pride in that, but I also know that that is the business model by nature and not by accident. Is there any particular things that you feel like like are are the the core strengths or the core things that you uh, would like to advise on? Sure, I mean, and I say this with all humility, but also with objective data. No one in this industry is doing demand generation and content strategy like me. Period. Um, just from an objective view, I know what's out there. I know what people are doing. I'm seeing it. You know, you've got Titans of CNC and individuals and those creators who are doing great content, right? They're doing great stuff for that specific entity. But when it comes to other manufacturers who are selling these things like they are, is just they're not doing it. They think that they're doing it correct with trade shows and the way that they've always done it. But a true demand generation and content strategy plan with the right individual, um, you can make a lot of great noise and stand out in a lot of, uh, a lot of strategic ways while others are just kind of sitting on their hands and doing the same thing. So demand generation content strategy are going to be the big things as well as just providing overall vision casting for what it is that you need to be doing and what to, you need to stop doing. Um, so being a, a experienced and kind of auditing current programs, current costs and saying, hey, here's where we should be shifting. Here's where we should be staying, holding, removing, yada, yada. So lots of value there. But I will say again, with that demand generation and content strategy focus, that's where I'm going to really, really outshine a lot of the other individuals in the market. Awesome. I think you're going to make a huge impact in the industry. And I definitely want to say congratulations for you making this leap, taking this leap and, and going on to the next journey of your career. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my, my wife was was pretty, pretty nervous. 
you know, as, <laughs> as, as, as you know, natural to her. But, uh, but knowing that I've got a lot of uh, really great support. And uh, I'm really the most blessed dude that I know. And again, I may be biased, but I, I genuinely feel that because gratitude is my attitude. And though I'm an optimistic realist, I'm still very much both. So this may be a little bit too early to ask this question, but do you have any plan to, to scale your operation? Or are you thinking about just doing individual consulting or what are your, some of your plans for the future? So I'm diversifying a little bit, obviously, with my partnership with MTD CNC being one of their you know, um, very esteemed, and I'm proud to be one of their, their U.S. presenters. That's great. Um, I think right now, so I can ensure that I'm still providing value to my clients, I want to I want to keep it very segmented right now. I want to make sure that I that what I'm doing because I got to where I wanted to be a lot faster than what a lot of individuals get and a lot faster than what I originally intended. That's completely OK. Um, and as much as I'd love to scale, I actually without giving away too much, I have a lot of opportunity with things that I'm working on currently that could become much bigger than I ever truly intended. So I'm doing what I always say I'm going to do. I'm going to be a good human and I'm going to do the things that I said I'm going to do and I'm going to provide value. And then whatever greatness comes from that will not be by accident. And um, and I'll definitely be ready for that. So for time being, love where it's at. It, 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 it's it's really awesome and I'm super thankful for it, but always open-minded to how I can take this to the next level and make it a real adventure. Awesome. Eddie, well, thank you very much. Congratulations again for making this leap in your career. Uh, I, hopefully this is like an inspiration to people watching this podcast and, you know, maybe the next person will take their leap today because of being able to watch this episode and watch you through your journey. Oh, I really appreciate it. Like, thank you so much for, for allowing me to, to be a weirdo on your show and tell my story. And I'm always open to connect with anybody and help them just as much as everyone has helped me. Thank you again, Eddie. Where, where can people find you at? I find me up on LinkedIn, Eddie Saunders Jr. I'm across the socials as well as Facebook and Instagram. But lastly, if you want to check out my site, it's www.speak-friendly.com. Check it out at speak dashfriendly.com. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Eddie.